I'm not sure, man. We may have to reschedule this because um, I see Travis is not only is he not late, he's actually early. So I'm not sure about this one. We may just have to go ahead and, and cancel or reschedule. Thanks, brother. Absolutely, we'll do that, brother. We'll certainly pray for you. Uh, Curtis has got some teeth uh, pain, too, mouth pain there as well. And I'll tell you, that's, that can just get you, but you certainly will. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Just wanted to share a few ground rules before we get started. Remember, we're here first and foremost to be discipled, break the bread of life, and hear from the Word of God, and for fellowship. So if you have a question or a comment, please feel free to post it in the chat, and we'll do the best we can to keep up with those and make sure we give you an answer. But if someone does say something, just remember to be kind and courteous. Um, you know, we're Christians. We're here to exemplify Christ and to uplift His holy name. So with no further ado, let's go ahead and get into the Word of God. Amen. I love that amen there. Yes, I'm playing with my soundboard. <laughs> yeah, um, it's real too. That's, that, that pain is, is horrible when it gets you with your teeth, man. Just just affects the whole body. Just makes you sometimes just irritable, right? Okay, if you have your Bibles, um, we are in uh, Acts chapter uh, 6. Really, more Acts chapter 7. We're going to finish up a little bit of review from Acts chapter 6, 13, 14, 15-ish. Get into verse uh, the first couple of verses in, in Acts chapter seven. Um, I, I know we do have some prayer request uh, pre-recorded. Yeah, it's pre-recorded. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Roger, you made it. Praise God. We got the Runyon brothers here. Um, Cliff, I saw you there too. I said, brother, thank you guys so much for being with us. Um, Again, guys, if you have prayer requests that are related to you, feel free to, to go ahead and let us know. Um, feel free to post those. If it's about somebody else, make sure that you're okay with it first because a lot of people don't want their, their sort of um, issues or needs, probably a better word, not issues. Um, it's been a long day. You guys should just pray for me. Uh, their needs um, made public. Um, so just please know that. Um, let's go ahead and do this. We're going to pray and we're going to jump into this. Y'all pray for me as well this evening. I've been, uh, we've got a lot of stuff on my mind, a lot of stuff going on. And um, it's been a long day, I think, for everybody. So let's go ahead and pray and let's get into the Word of God. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for this time, dear God. And first and foremost, we thank you for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, through who, through which, Father God, we have eternal salvation. We're so thankful for that. And dear God, we pray for those that do not know you as Lord and Savior, that, Father, you'll tender their heart. And, and dear God, they'll submit themselves unto you and seek you out before it's utterly too late. And Lord, our heart goes out to those that are um, in the way and that have been affected already and will be affected by the, the hurricane, dear God, and the events in the Middle East. Um, Father, we, we see news that is just um, heartbreaking, to say the least. And dear God, we just pray for, for leadership in our country, dear God, and that leadership looks to you in all ways and all, <clears throat> and dear God, um, for direction. And Lord, we thank you again for all that you've given us, for it's in Christ's name we pray, and amen. Okay. Um, Glory to God. Let's do this. So Acts chapter number 6, verse 13. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're sort of picking up here. And if you guys recall, I may have to let me get my mouse over here. Um, we're going to go back up real quick to Acts chapter 6, verse number 9. See, we're talking about Stephen. Um, I want to make sure you guys recall that. That way everything is in the proper context here. Um, so we're talking about Stephen and some of the things Stephen was doing, and, and Stephen was actually having a, a, a conversation with um, some of the folks from, um, from Alexandria and from Sicilia, the parts of Asia. They were, they were really arguing with Stephen about the Word of God, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel, is what it boils down to. Um, they were just arguing about the gospel. And remember, like the Alexandrians, the library in Alexandria was one of the most famous libraries really in all of history. I think there was a well over, what, 2,000 scrolls, and I may be underestimating um, that. It may have been th you know, thousands and thousands. I can't recall, guys, but the amount of scrolls um, and quote-unquote knowledge that was there, yes, you're going to hear the puppies in the background. They're in the next room um, kind of uh, living it up, so living the puppy life. But um, that, that, that library, t still today, you know, when people talk about it, they look back at the Alexandrian Library of, as this, this pinnacle and oracle of knowledge. Um, but the Word of God, the scrolls that they had there were certainly corrupt. And we, can, we will do a study on the King James Bible and why we use the King James Bible and why for, you know, for thousands of years the King James Bible, well, I say thousands of years, we're really a couple hundred years, the King James Bible um, has been the um, the litmus, you know, for the English-speaking people. Um, we we know the 1611 King James Bible, but as a matter of fact, if you if you ever get a chance, you actually can Google it. Google uh, 1611 King James Bible, and if you look at it, I have one. Um, you you almost we almost can't read them because it's in old English. Um, so it wasn't 1611. So you know we're looking at less than less than a thousand years there um, that we've been using the King James Bible, but several hundred years um, the King James Bible has been the Bible that God has preserved for the English-speaking people. Now, a lot of people, they disagree with that, and they say, well, there's these other Bibles that they are just easier to read and easier to understand. Well, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15 to do what? Study to show thyself approved unto God, work when need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study. That means there's some effort that has to go into it, folks. We've got to apply ourselves. If we apply ourselves to studying the word of God, and learning the Word of God, this King James Bible would not be, quote-unquote, a stumbling block for anybody. And it isn't. It's written on like a sixth-grade level. The last I heard, they did a review of it, and it's actually on like the sixth-grade level. Yes, I'm sort of getting off on a tangent. Um, if you guys seen the movie Up, Squirrel, right? Um, but that's all right. It's okay. It's all about the Word of God. Um, but we, we need to understand certain things when we're talking about the Word of God, especially when we talk about evangelism, going out and sharing the Word of God. One is we have to know what we believe and why we believe it, right? Because that's faith. Hebrews chapter 11, the whole of faith, verses 1 and 2 specifically talk about what faith is and the reward thereof of having faith. Um, so we, we, un we need to know what it is we understand, but we also need to understand the importance and the history behind the Word of God that we so choose. Uh, we don't use any other versions of the Word of God. I've got, I'll be honest with you, in my software that I, that I run, um, I don't know how many different versions of the Bible. I really don't um, that are in there, um, but I use... Well, I use two, it's all, but they're both the King James Bible. One of them actually has, well, I'll show you what it looks like. It is st still the King James Bible, but it puts everything at the bottom of the screen. Some people that really kind of freaks out, but you, you get all of the, the references there. It's kind of cool, right, because i got my Strong's right at the bottom. But anyway, all King James Bible, right? When I say versions of it, it's still the King James Bible. I guess it's really the illustration and the way it's presented, the format. That's the right word. Man, I'm struggling with, with vocabulary tonight. Praise God. 
I think I think what it is, I think what it is, is these Runyon boys actually were were not late; they were on time, and that's totally thrown me off. So, hey Deb. So uh, I, I think that's what it is. So you guys just bear with me. So in case you guys didn't know, if you scroll up, you'll see that Travis was actually early this evening. All right, back to where we were. <laughs> so we were talking about uh, so how we got from Alexandria to, to Travis being early. You know, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Um, so we're talking about Stephen. He was disputing them. And that, that disputing, what we're talking about there is a, a very um, heartfelt conversation. And guys, you know, a lot of times people feel uncomfortable. Yeah, 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 yeah. People feel uncomfortable about um, discussing the Word of God. You know, and most of the time it's not because, you know, they, this lack of faith um, in God. A lot of times it's, it's their lack of knowledge of the Word of God. Because when you think about it, that's where a lot of our comfort comes from. Now, don't, don't get, when I'm talking about comfort, don't get that confused um, with arrogance, right? Because that's one thing to be comfortable in the Word of God. And another thing to be arrogant, because with comfort you have humility, right? And, and you know, I had, um, as a matter of fact, Pastor, I, I certainly don't, you know, the man's great, great well of wisdom. Um, he made mention today when I was speaking with him, he talked about, you know, when you know you're humble is, is when you're no longer humble, right? And, you know, I was like, well, you know what, that, that makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? Um, but here, it, again, it's one thing to, to be um, confident and, and comfortable in the Word of God without getting into arrogance, right? So there, there's two different things. It, it can be a fine line, and a lot of times as Christians we will um, unwillingly and unwittingly cross that line from, from, from comfort and confidence into arrogance. And that's what drives a lot of people out of church, especially when it comes to new Christians. Um, be careful. Be very careful. Um, you cannot force somebody to believe something. So just just know that, right? Um, it's it's, and I'm not saying don't witness to them, don't don't discuss the word of God. That's not what I'm saying at all. But just always remember that you cannot force, nor should you really try to force somebody to to have faith and believe in something, right? Um, we what we do is we lay out what Jesus, who Jesus was, what He done for us, right, and what the reward is in heaven for that. Um, and then if they have questions, we can certainly go through and walk them through the Word of God. So th that's really, when we're talking about witnessing, that's what it boils down to. You know, telling them all about Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, and then, you know, what did Jesus, what has Jesus done for us? And guys, there's no shortage. Some people are like, well, I, you know, there's, I, I, I don't know if I've got, Jesus has done more for us today, probably within the last hour, than, than we could ever, ever even realize. Right, we are a blessed people, regardless. Okay, um, enough of the 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 chasing squirrels. So Stephen was was talking to these educated folks, right? Um, and much like what they like to do, that's going to that's going to bring us up to verse thirteen. I'm going to try to bring that up to the top of your screen here. All right, perfect. So that brings us to verse thirteen. So what he did, he talked to these councils, and they set up false witnesses, which said, these, uh, This man seeth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. So the holy place they're certainly talking about there. If we go back a little bit, um, you can, we'll see that they're, they're talking about the temple. Um, and, you know, really the only temple that's holy was Jesus's, uh, certainly Jesus' body, because that's when he said that, you know, he'd tear the temple down and, and in three days build it back again. And I believe it was, what, 30 and 6 years that it took the... Um, the children of Israel to actually build the temple, and that's what really made them mad. But anyway, um, so they set up false witnesses, right? And what? why did they have to set up false witnesses? Well, because the conversations they were had, they were making no headway. They, they could not dispute not only the power with which and the, and the fervor with which um, Stephen was, was having the conversation, and that's that confidence, confidence in Jesus Christ. It's not confidence in us or our knowledge. Um, it's confidence in Jesus Christ. Having the knowledge certainly will add to that, but it's not confidence of our own ability. It's confidence in what and who Jesus is, and that's what we learn by studying the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Right. That was for you, Travis. Roger. Amen. There you go. That's you. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. So um, he's talking about again here and set up false witnesses, which said, This man sees us not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. So um, they're making a direct attack. 
Now, these false witnesses, simply, these are men that, that are willing to lie. These are men that are nothing more than willing to lie. They have really no values. Um, and it's, isn't it kind of ironic, that, ironic um, I'll try it in English this time, that every time the, the Jews find themselves in a position and situation to where they cannot dispute the power of God, that they certainly have to lie. We can go back to, to Jesus. We see it in Paul. We see it at the tomb, right? What did they What did they do to the two soldiers, the Roman soldiers that were standing guard at the tomb? They bribed them. They had to bribe them, right? Not only did they bribe them, but they went as far as to say that um, that if you guys will say that he was stolen away, that that we will we will basically defend you in in front of um, or to your commanders, because the Roman soldiers and, and just a little bit of I guess bonus, if you will. The Roman soldiers that were, were charged with guarding a prisoner, and in this case, guarding anything, if anything happened to that, and the tomb was a.k.a. robbed, as we know it wasn't, um, it, Jesus walked out of there, praise God, by, uh, of his own godly ability. That, that grave couldn't hold, it, it, hold him if it wanted to. Um, but they would, they would have been put to death. Right, um, so that's what they said when they bribed him with money. He said, "Listen, if you'll say that they somebody came and stole him away, that I'm going to paraphrase that. You know, when when your commanders, you know, that you report to, um, you know, when, when you have to go re- tell them that that we'll defend you. So, but again, they cannot dispute that the word and the power of God, the same power, the same word today that cannot be disputed. You guys realize that it cannot be disputed today." You know, it's not it's not nothing that was special in this time about the word of God, um, not being where they could not dispute it. What it is is the love and the fervor is is I think much different than than it is in many instances today. And talking about instances, we're talking about people. The love that that Stephen had is is based off of the love that he had for Christ, the faith that he had in Christ. And I wonder where we sort of are today with that, right? So, again, the irony here is the ones that that were so adamant about the law, right, here saying that, that, that you know, he was speaking blasphemous words against the holy place, the temple, and the law, that these were the ones that were asking people to do what? To lie, right? And why is that a big deal? Well, let's look at something here in, in Exodus twenty sixteen, right? Thou shalt not bear what false witness against thy neighbor. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. That's the ninth commandment. You want to talk about the law, the law that they were accusing Stephen of, of, of breaking himself, they were doing. <laughs> you, I mean, you see the irony there. Let's, let's go back a minute. Hold on. Let's see if this back button actually works. Oh, let's see if it works. Glory to God, it worked. All right. And set up false witnesses which said, This man seeth us not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and against the law. Wait a minute. Okay, now back to ninth. Uh, Exodus twenty sixteen, thou shalt not what bear false witness against thy neighbor. Huh. So there are groups of people today that abstain from, from things like technologies and things like that. But they have no problem allowing or, or utilizing other people to do that and to use that technology. Um, and, and that kind of bothers me a little bit. And the reason being, and, and so I'm trying to take a real world example and uh, today and sort of apply it to then, is if you believe something is not good for you, you, you shouldn't try to exploit somebody else and get them to do it and think it's okay, right? Because if you believe it's wrong for you, then you should believe it's wrong for them, regardless of what their belief system is, right? So, you know. Don't think for a minute that you're justified in having somebody do something that's against the Word of God because they may not be saved or they may believe something a little different. You know, what you're doing is you're enticing a brother to sin. So be very careful there. Be very, very, very careful there. Okay. So anyway, so, and again, when we study the Word of God, we do take care. You guys know that, that man, I, I'm, a, I'm like a snail when it comes to the Word of God. I, if you're wanting to look at a chapter, you better sit down and think, okay, it's going to take us a month, six weeks, maybe longer to get through a chapter. Um, because I'm not in a hurry. You know, if the Lord says, hey, shut up, Ron, let's move on, then we'll do it. But I truly believe that 
tying the scripture together and getting that whole backstory, that whole picture is so important. It's so important. Um, praise God. But can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, praise God. I love that. I don't know why I like that so much. <laughs> okay, um, here we go. So I think we've sort of talked about that. Again, it's, it's a total mess. It's hypocrisy at its, at its very best. You know, and as Christians, what, what, do, what do most people, um, what do most people use as an excuse not to come to church? Honestly. Hearing crickets. Yes, I have a cricket sound too. Um, it's, what do they do? They claim that we're, that we're hypocrites. Like, oh, you, your church is just full of hypocrites. You know my answer to them, and maybe I shouldn't say this. Um, and not all the time I do, but I, I certainly, I'll tell you this, I, stay, I, th I think it all the time. I don't necessarily say it all the time. Um, but is you know what, hey, we've got room for one more, praise God. We're not, you know, we should not a actively be a hypocrite for sure, certainly, right? Um, we certainly should not do that. But here, what we see is hypocrisy at its best. And we've got to be careful that we don't do the same thing, and that's being hypocrites, Right? Don't don't be don't be afraid to say you know I've messed up. I'm not asking you to glorify sin in no way, shape, or form. Am I asking you um, or, or to, to validate um, sin? Don't do that. That's not it. That's not what we're getting at. But the same it's the same thing it, it, at the same time. It's it's certainly okay to say you know what I, I made a mistake and I, I, I'm I'm wrong in that. You know I know people that they are so stubborn they can only see things one way. And even to the point I've seen, I, I know some that will even take scripture and try to back it up. And it's like, you're taking it out of context uh, from that perspective. So just be careful. Um, be, be careful when it comes to, you, you know, even being perceived as, as being a hypocrite. Now, do we make mistakes? Absolutely. You know, are we all going to make mistakes? Yes. And I think at the end of the day, if we just realize that, that, hey, we've made mistakes. You know what? It does, Travis. The flesh certainly does. And, you know, the closer we get to, to Christ and the more we know about the Word of God, the more confidence we have, the less that will happen. And we're going to get to something here in just a minute. I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Travis. I, 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 Lord willing, if I don't forget, um, I, I'm certainly going to try to bring your statement back up. Because when we get into chapter 7, verse number 2, what you just said certainly is, um, is relevant. Certainly relevant. Okay, questions, comments, concerns, snide remarks, other than, um, other than Iranian boys. I don't want any snide remarks from, from you guys. Not, not, no. <laughs> you guys know we love you. Uh, okay, so hypocrisy at its best, uh, false witnesses. Um, you know, so a couple of, of scriptures. I'll, I'll go ahead and pull them up here real quick. That way you guys can see them um, when we're talking about hypocrisy and false witnesses, right? Um, Proverbs 19.5, and you actually down in 9 as well. Um, a false witness shall not be what? Unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. The Bible certainly tells us that what's done in, in private and dark will be brought into light. You know, if you think you've done something, you got away with it, um, you didn't get away with it. You may, you know, there, sure, certainly there might be flesh uh, here on earth that doesn't know what happened. Um, you know, but not from God's judgment. Everything will be brought into light. Everything will be brought into light. The thing is this, is don't do it in the first place and you ain't got to worry about it, right? That's what I'm talking about, praise God. Verse number nine, a false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall what? Perish. Perish. Absolutely. Now, what is this talking about? Is this talking about the, you know, the, the carnal life here? Well, the Bible says there is a death unto sin. It also says we shouldn't ask for it. Now, do we know what that is? No, um, I don't. Th I'm not so sure. It's any one action, or it's a point that God said enough is enough. And can God do that? Absolutely, He's God. And the Bible does tell us in the New Testament that there is a sin unto death. Paul tells us that. So, um, you know, the thing is, this is let's not get into a position where we find ourselves even trying to tempt God. You know, tempt not the Lord thy God. And that's really, guys, it's kind of what's talking about, you know. People are like, well, you know, uh, you, you know, I'm, t I'm tempting God if I ask him to do this or that. Okay, that is a form of temptation. But at the same time is, you know, don't go around living this, this, this sin-filled life and, and, you know, expecting not to be punished. 
because the Bible says that God chastens those that he loves. Right? So if we're chastened by God, that means one, he loves us. And two, it's a, it's a learning experience for us and for others. Okay? If God's chastened us for something, let's not be selfish about it. Again, I'm not saying we have to get into all the de details about the sin, right? Because we, we don't ever want to, to, glor to glorify sin or even be perceived as glorified sin. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's certainly useful and beneficial for others. You know, if you know somebody that's going through something um, or maybe, maybe facing something very similar to what you fell victim to, share that with them. Um, again, you don't, need to t you don't need to give the details, right? All right, let's move on. Let's get back to where we were here. Um, oh, last place is Matthew 26, 59 is where Jesus, um, they brought false witnesses against Jesus himself. And Jesus, uh, the paraphrase, you know, when Jesus said that, you know, don't be surprised they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. Right, so people are going to bring false witnesses, and sometimes people, even the closest to you, will bring false witness. And, you know, why do they do that? Why do people want to tear down somebody else? You know, if you don't agree with them, you don't get along, and there's that kind of thing, just let it be. Let it be. Um, there's no reason to get in, into this tearing somebody down just to make yourself feel better. You know, as Christians, we do not and we should not engage in that. Should not. And, and you know, there's just, there's nothing, there's nothing, you know, glorifying God that comes out of that. All right. Back to work for All right. Okay. Verse 14, for we have heard him say that this Jesus, him being Stephen, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Well, yeah, um, of course. Now, of course, when we're talking about the ones that Moses delivered, we're certainly talking about what he brought down from the mount, right? Um, the Ten Commandments. And you guys realize that um, he made that trip twice. The first set of the Ten Commandments never made it. Uh, to the well, really didn't make it to the children of Israel. They were broken. He dropped them. He had to go back up and get two more. The two tablets that were brought down. You guys, do you guys know that? Well, you guess what you do now. Praise God. All right. Um, now, so um, where am I at? To the left. Oh yeah. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place again. See, they thought, and that shows you how much they knew, right? And, and Again, knowing the scripture and studying it, because too many times we take stuff out of context, we don't understand the sort of the audience to which it was written, so we don't understand what Jesus is saying. Let's go. Let's take a look at some of this. Matthew twenty-four, verse two. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. They were, they were thinking that Jesus himself was going to cause this great uprising. But what you learn is that the temple was destroyed. Now, there are those that believe um, that, you know, well, let's just say that there are those that have an alternate belief in where the, the temple actually was built. Um, you can look at the Temple Mount, um, what we know the Temple Mount to be today. You can look at that as, you know, was that where the temple was? Or was it truly in the city of David? We're going to study this. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time in it, and I'm just going to I'm just going to lay out the facts and what the Bible says, and you guys can you guys can choose for yourself. At the end of the day, does it make a difference? No, but it certainly is a really good um, a good thing to, to sort of study, I guess. Okay, so here they again they were thinking Jesus was going to you know this, he's they're ta he's talking about you know him destroying the temple. Mark fourteen fifty eight, we heard him say, "I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands." It's like, now wait a minute. Okay, if they would have listened to what he said. So first off, we know there weren't there, tools weren't allowed up there to chisel the stone on the Temple Mount or where the temple was. We call it Temple Mount, as the traditional location is, or the Temple Mount, which many believe is a sort of a small hill. Um, in the city of David, the old, in the old town, right? Um, but look what he said. He said, we heard him say, I would destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days, I will build another made without hands. That should have keyed him in right there. 
I will build another that's made without hands. Well, you know, John chapter 1, there was nothing made that wasn't made by him, right? So everything we know is made by God. And so here, but it wasn't the hands of man that built a physical structure. Here we know for a fact that in Mark 14, 58, he is certainly not talking about the, um, the physical temple that was built from stone. They, they just didn't catch it. They didn't want to catch it. They may have caught it, but they didn't want, they didn't want it to say that. They wanted to be able to charge him with it. John 2.19, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Did he say he, he would build it up? He said, I will what? Raise it up. This is a resurrection. This is a resurrection. Now remember, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Right? They didn't believe in that at all. And the Sadducees made up. Well, first off, which is where the, the high priest came from. Um, we're talking about the Sanhedrin, which is, I believe, 71. I, heard, I think I've heard some people say 70, but generally I believe it's, it, it's, it's known to be 71 made up, the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish high court. Um, we would think of it as a combination of, in the United States, would be the Congress, the President, and the Supreme Court. If you took all three of those and, and meshed them into what the Jews would call the Sanhedrin. I know people will probably try to sharpshoot that, but it, it's 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 a pretty close representation, right? Yep, absolutely. It's a resurrection, brother. You're absolutely right. It is the resurrection. Jesus is talking about when he says this temple. He's talking about his he's talking about his body, um, and in three days, what I will raise it up. So, first off, they were so close minded to the resurrection, not believing in it, that. For this, for that portion of Sanhedrin, which were were Sadducees, the the thought of an actual resurrection wasn't even was foreign to them. Okay, all right, where are we at? All right, questions, comments, concerns. The last thing I want to pull out of verse fourteen and kind of point out is this right here, guys. That is one thing that will get you in more trouble today is the customs of man. When you look at what goes on in church services, and, and you know, I'm gonna, as usual, I'm gonna put a plug in for for our church and our pastor. Um, there are traditions of man, traditions of the church, and there are the um, there are the the commandments of God, right? The institutions that God has has given, and we when we look at it, you know, we're looking at really we're the Lord's Supper and, and baptism. Those are the ordinances of the church. That's what God is charged with. So don't get biblical ordinances confused with manly customs. Well, wait a minute. We've always done it this way, and, and people get so upset about it. Listen, that's a custom. That, that's not an ordinance of the church. So don't get, man, I want to say that so bad, but I better not all offend somebody. Don't get upset, and don't get your feather ruffled. If there's a custom that some, for some reason has been sort of set aside, it's a custom. It's not an ordinance of the church. Okay, so just, just understand that. You know, there's, there's, there's churches that put, you know, trees up. There's some that don't. Well, if the ones that don't generally go back to Jeremiah, where it talks about the heathens that bring in the trees and decorate them and don't do that. Um, that's, that's scriptural. It's back there. You know, some churches do. Do they bring it in as, as, a, as a pagan um, idol? No, I don't believe that at all. If I did, I certainly wouldn't be there. Um, and I'm not talking about our church in particular. I was talking about churches in general at this point. Um, so that's, you know, again, please just, just know that there are the two ordinances of the church and there are customs of man, and those are very different, very different. The Jews certainly, especially I believe it was the Sadducees that certainly... Um, looked at the customs um, very, very strongly to the T, to the letter, right? And the customs were as, were held in the same degree, really, as the Mosaic Law itself. So the customs that they developed um, really became the, the same degree of importance, importance as the Mosaic Law. It, now, I believe the individual laws, there's like 614. Now, I've heard some people say those expound out to well over 1,000. Um, but I'm, I'm positive there's like 613 laws in the Old Testament um, that m was derived from you know, the Mosaic laws. Um, 
That, that, that would be horrible to try to follow, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, make sure I don't have anything here. Praise God. <laughs> ah, Roger, you're funny. Verse 15. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face at his, at, as it had been the face of an angel. Chew on that one for just a second. Okay, now this word council generally um, generally is associated with the Sanhedrin that we talked about, the 71 members that were made up of the high priest, um, the, the Sadducees, which and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were was the aristocrats, and that's where the, the high priest came from. The Sadducees were more of the blue-collar working. Their power wasn't derived from you know the aristocratic method, if you will, uh, or means, which is primarily what money. Um, it was really the numbers of the people. You know, so if you think of this, if you, when you think of the, the Pharisees, you think of more of the blue color. Think of the Sadducees, more white color. Now, is that, um, is that strict? No. Um, but that's a really good starting point to sort of begin to look at where they were different. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that they were different in, and there, was, there were some things that they were very similar in. So, okay, dog's probably going to bark here in a second. I just see him take off. And all that sat in the council, we talked about that, looking steadfastly on him, they were staring at him. <laughs> they, they certainly, you know, and you could you could imagine how they looked at him. It probably wasn't one of, of envy. Um, I'd say it was, they were they were scowling at him pretty heavily. <clears throat> Saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Now, have we seen this before? Obviously, I wouldn't ask the question. Yes, we have, right? Yes, Brother Ron, we certainly have. Where do we see that? Well, if I recall correctly, it was in Exodus 34 and 30. Praise God. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh to him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned on him, and Moses talked to them. Right? So Moses' face, I may have to kind of go up here just a little bit. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have done 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down from the mount, um, from Mount Sinai, with the two tables of the testimony of Moses' hand, when he come down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he had talked to them. Right, so we've seen this before. Right, we've seen it. What does it what what is this indicative of? Well, I'm glad you asked, because different people will sort of put it in different context. Is it where um, Moses came in to the very presence of God? Because God, I'm going to tell you something. And, and you know what? However it happens, when you come into the presence of God, when you experience God, you are never, ever the same. Never the same. You cannot be. You say, well, does that mean everybody's saved? No, that's not what I'm saying. And for the saved person that, that you know, we all know, when, when we came into the presence of God, especially, you know, that moment when we bowed down and we, we asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our lives, to save us, to forgive our sin, right? And, and you didn't say sins. No, it's sin, right? Um, and when we come in the presence of God, we're never, you're never, ever the same. Even for the unredeemed, they're never the same. So when you go out, if you, if you witness to somebody, and you know what, you're like, wow, they just, you know, they didn't, they didn't get saved. Well, first off, you don't know that. Yeah, they may not have said the prayer openly with you, um, but in their heart they may have. The moment you walked away, they may, have, they may have called on God. But I will tell you, regardless, that individual that comes into contact with God, either through the Holy Ghost, through the through witnessing of, of God's people, right? Um, and that's why it's so important when we talk about evangelism and, and spreading the Word of God. But to spread it, we have to know it, right? <clears throat> Be confident in it um, and comfortable in it. They're never the same. Now, Moses, when he was on Mount Sinai, obviously could not look on God directly in his face and no man would live. We know that. But after God had passed by, Moses, the Bible tells us Moses looked, turned and looked and saw the backside of him. And just just being able to look on God, we know that his countenance changed. He was basically turned white. So we don't have an, an account of Stephen, and, and uh, of, well, an account like that with Stephen. That doesn't, one, it doesn't mean it happened. You know, so we know that, that he had an intimate 
uh, an intimate experience with God. There's no doubt about it. Do we have full record of it? I don't think so. Do we need it? No. Because we have precedence that's already been set in the Old Testament in, in Exodus 34, 29 through 32, 33 that tells us that. We see that. We know how they change like that. So at some point, Stephen certainly, certainly was in the presence of God. There's no doubt. No doubt. And we'll see here in a few minutes um, some, some things that are pretty important. All right, questions, comments, concerns? All right, praise God. Y'all, y'all enjoy this. I get excited about it. I do. You know, I look forward to this, one, because we get a fellowship. And this is what fellowship is all about. Now, you can be eating steak or whatever you want, but unless you're discussing the Word of God, if discussing Jesus Christ, you're really not having true fellowship in the sense of what fellowship is. Right? And what more? What else do we want to talk about? Satan would have us talk about anything but this. You realize that. When we get a, uh, and guys, I'm going to pick on y'all here for just a minute. Women, y'all know what you, y'all can take this for yourself. But um, get a group of men together, eight godly men together. And, and I'll tell you something. Within, within a couple of moments, Satan will try to put something out there to get you talking about anything but the Word of God. It could be something that happened that day. It could be a, a sports. Sport, he loves using sports. And we know that. I'm not picking on sports. Well, maybe I am. Um, but he loves to use it. Why? Because it's effective. I mean, guys, come on. Let's think about it. Satan, you know, if you go to Matthew chapter 4, and you'll see where Satan, threw, well, let's just do it right quick. Daggone it. Let's just do this. Matthew 4. Listen up. Here we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness, capital S, um, to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, that's literal 40 days and 40 nights. That's not indicative of a long period of time. It says 40 days and 40 nights. He was afterward and hungered. That's where God became flesh. Right? And when the tempter, Satan, came to him, and he said, now listen, this is where Satan has an opportunity to tempt Jesus Christ. I want you to look at real quick, pay attention to what he tempts him with, right? Um, if thou be the Son of God, capital G, this is the one true God, command that these stones be made bread. But if he, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall li- not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Now, Again, he's quote, it's a direct quote. Uh, well, it's a little bit of a, well, God's, Jesus is a direct quote um, of Scripture in the Old Testament. And we can get into that. I don't want to, if I get started down that path, well, I'll never get through this. Um, if you guys want, we can come back and look at it later. All right, so that was the first one. Jesus responded with what? The Word of God, which is what? The sword of the Lord. The sword of the Lord is the Word of God. Praise God. You know. What he did here is he set precedence, and he showed us by, by his example that Jesus, what he did, he could have called down legions of angels. He could have destroyed Satan with, by snapping his finger or just a thought, but he didn't. He, he had victory over him through the word of God. So you think, you think 2 Timothy 2.15 is important, praise God? It absolutely is because through that, through that, and faith in Jesus Christ is where we can certainly have victory over the devil. No weapon formed against them shall prosper. Glory. All right. Anyway, y'all gonna get me preaching in a second. Then the devil taketh him up into the uh, into the holy city. You might only guess where that is, um, and setteth him upon the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus' response. Second temptation. It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Don't tempt him. Right? I'm going to go on because if I get on this, I'll, I'll never get done. Again, the devil taketh him up into This is the last chance. He's got third chance, right? He's got, he's got two strikes against him. You know, he, he's there. What's he going to pitch? We'll see. Sports reference, right? Again, the devil, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. This is the last chance. That's important. I'll get back to it in a second. Then Jesus saith unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. 
the third and final chance that, that Satan had to tempt Jesus Christ. And if Jesus would have, would have succumbed to any of these, guess what, folks? Our fate would have been sealed. Satan would have achieved that which he wanted to achieve, and that is the destruction of mankind. It would have happened right here. And Jesus, through all of the, 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 the vehicles that he could have defended or destroyed Satan with, he chose the Word of God because that set precedence and an example for us today that we have the same victory. Right there we get a... Amen! Amen. Okay. All right. <clears throat> She's back to where we were. Um, so, when, when we're talking about, when we're talking about the power of God and coming into the presence of God, guys, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And you all know what I'm talking about, right? You ever get into that, that get down and, and you're, you're in that, that prayer and, and you're just talking to God because you're struggling with something? It's happened. I, you know, we all go through it. I'm going through it. And, you know, and you feel the power and the presence of God on you. There's nothing better, is there? There's no better feeling in the world than knowing that right there with us is the God that created everything. You think that somebody doesn't love you? Well, friends, the God who created everything thinks so much of you that not only will he come meet with you in your time of need, but friends, he never leaves you nor forsakes you. Go back to, to Acts, the first two chapters in Acts. And what did Jesus say? And if you think about this, when Jesus said, I will what? I will not leave thee comfortless. And that's when he said, I'll pray to, I'll pray to, I'll pray to the Father that he send the Comforter, and the Comforter is the Holy Ghost. The third form of that triune God. Glory. Whew, man, I get excited about this stuff. All right. What time is it here? All right, 744. Then said the high priest, are these things so? So the high priest, right? This guy is, <laughs> the power that he has in Jerusalem is amazing. It's amazing. And it's one of the reasons that they would not accept Christ as a Messiah because they would have to surrender that power and they know it. You give a chance. Verse number two. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon. Now, if you've been either at, at church or you've been uh, listening in by Facebook, you'll know that we've been going over Abraham. I say we, Pastor, have been preaching on it, doing a tremendous job um, preaching on it. But I want to show you real quick um, where we're at here. So we're talking about Charon. It's, that's Heron, right? So Terra, the, Terra left Ur of the Chaldees, went up the Euphrates River Valley, some five to 600 mile journey by foot, not like he jumped in an Uber, right? Said, hey, yeah, but no, it didn't happen. You know, didn't go out and get on Spirit Airlines. Well, that's pretty cool, in Spirit Airlines. Anyway, um, wow, that's neat. Anyway, and, go, and went up to Heron. And that's where Tara died, right? Um, Heron was actually the younger, I believe the younger brother of, of Abraham, but he did not leave Ur. He actually died in Ur. Um, and so was Heron named after him? I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I will find that. But anyway, so this is where he was, and this is what we're talking about, right, is, is this area right here. Now, I don't know. Yeah, here we go. Here's Heron uh, on a little bit different map. I like this. Um, I didn't even know I had this. It's really cool because it gives you sort of the, the lay of the land, and you can get an idea uh, of, of what he had to go through. So you can, you can imagine sort of the marshy lowlands going up the Euphrates River Valley um, up into Heron. Now, Heron today is, is really on, on the... It appears to be, from my perspective, and what I know and what I can see is in modern-day Turkey, but the border with Syria is right there as well. I mean, it's very close, but I'm pretty sure that this is modern-day Turkey. If somebody wants to, um, if somebody wants to correct me, I, I'm, I'm, you know, um, I'm not 90, I'm not 100% sure. I've got to actually do the overlay again. I did it once. I don't remember. I'm getting old. 
but I'm really sure that this area, um, it's actually the Artiri Highlands is in this area as well, and that's where not only did they believe the Garden of Eden was, is, is in this in this area, um, but also where the Ark rested. Um, got some good trivia about the Ark too, as a matter of fact. But um, the Garden of Eden, the Bible tells us that the Garden of Eden was, it's called the Garden of Eden because it was located in the east of the area known as Eden. So, if you ever wondered that, full of just, I won't say worthless stuff, but stuff that, I don't know how it sticks in there, who knows. <laughs> okay, so he gave him an opportunity there, right? But when we get to verse number two, and he said, this is Stephen. This is Stephen confronting the most powerful body in Jerusalem that the Jews know. This is his time that, that he could have stepped back and, and, and said, you know what, guys, no, it's not true at all, defended himself, and probably walked away. But he would have been compromised as, one, <laughs> everything that he believed in, um, and his integrity as well. And that's, that's more important, that his integrity and his faith stay true to Jesus Christ. He, he absolutely knew what was going to happen. He knew the outcome before he ever started talking. Because we see precedents already with what they did to Jesus. We, we know what happened there. We know what the Sanhedrin has a history of doing. Anybody that challenges them, especially when it comes to blasphemy. Blasphemy was punishable by death. Death by stoning, right? All right, so anyway. Um, and he said, this is a great speech too. If you look at this, I mean, you want to talk about power? You want to talk about faith? You want to talk about commitment? I... I, I Pray to God that I would have the faith and the fortitude that Stephen had this moment, this very moment that Stephen stood in front of the most powerful body known to that area, known to the Jews and the Hebrews. He knew what he was facing. He knew what the outcome was going to be. But you know what? He stood strong. And he said, men, brethren, and fathers, he did not, he did not in any way, shape, or form right here insult them right now the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham he's saying listen I'm one of you and we can get into the lineage of Abraham pastor's doing an amazing job I'll, I'll let him certainly do that um, guys I'm telling you if, you if you're if you're not tuning in um, you're missing out on some uh, some really really good buffets um when he was uh, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Sharon, right? So before he dwelt up in there, God certainly uh, appeared to him. We know that. And the closest thing we have is in Genesis. I'm gonna, let me finish reading this. I'll go back. Before he dwelt in Sharon, uh, Sharon, uh, eleven thirty two will tell us that the days of Terah were two hundred uh, were two hundred and five years, and and Terah died in Haran, right? So here in Genesis eleven, what we see is a, is, is really a transfer of. I hate this leadership or, or power, uh, prominence maybe. I'm not sure what the proper word is. You know, some of you um, folks that have that very diverse vocabulary, you can certainly help me out. Um, but this is where Abraham sort of, well, at the time, Abram um, stood up. He kind of came to the front. Before then, it was really Terah, um, Abraham's father, that was sort of leading the family. Now it's, it's Abraham's time. Abraham sort of steps into the spotlight. Hopefully that's not worded the wrong way. Okay. Um, when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharon, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. We're going to stop on verse 3. I'm going to talk a little bit about this um, in verse number 3 because there's some things in here that I'm going to make sure that, that we really kind of hone in on. What's this telling us today? How does this relate well, simply, well, one of the things certainly is look at the company that you keep. Because the company that you keep can certainly have an influence on you, on the flesh and the spirit. And those two battle against each other. We know that for sure. But certainly, certainly consider the company that you keep. Second Corinthians 6.14 Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Um, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Right? So, just be careful when we're talking about that. And fellowship again. When you get with fellowship, it's sharing and partnership. 
is what the word means. It's you know, in the Greek, um, 3352. I'll pull up one of those really cool things here that you guys can see. Um, here's Charon. Give me a second. got to bring it up here. Show the... i got to look at the other screen, and it kind of messes me up because it's just a little bit different than what I'm looking at. Yeah, I can't find it, but anyway. Um, oh, it's, <laughs> no wonder I can't find it. This is why I can't find it. Duh, sorry about that. 614. I'm looking for the word fellowship. I'm like, I don't see it because it's not there. This is what I'm looking for right here, fellowship. It's the Greek 3352 if you're looking at the Strong's, right? Um, that's one of the reasons I kind of like this. I love a traditional Bible, don't get me wrong, but mine's to the point that I don't know if I can write much more <laughs> in, in sections of it. Um, but we're looking at it right here. Strong's will tell us that it's sharing and partnership. So we talk about fellowship. All right. So anyway, consider the company you keep. Does that mean that you can't talk to them, can't talk with those that are unredeemed? Well, that's completely different than going hanging out with them and doing trying to do the same things you used to do and expect a different result because, well, I'm saved now. Well, okay, the, the difference result is the fact that you're still going to go to heaven, but your relationship with Jesus Christ can certainly, certainly, certainly be affected. Now, sin has... The, 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 the difference between sin for a redeemed child of God and an unredeemed person is this, is that the unredeemed, they're already bound for hell and ultimately the lake of fire at judgment. For the redeemed child of God... What does sin in our life do? Well, it it affects our relationship with Jesus Christ and our usability. It certainly has, you know, when we're talking about relationship, I think I think we have to t spend a little bit of time and really subdefine that and throw some some things in there. Usability is one. You know, don't go don't go saying God use me, God use me, God use me, and then you're out living like the devil. You know, if you, if you want to do that, I'm just, hey, it's great to be used by God, but once you start asking God, God, put me in a position to where I can be used. But when you ask that, friends, I'm going to tell you something, you better be ready to submit to the will of God because he'll certainly, he'll point it out. Whether, you're not will, whether or not you're willing to accept it's a completely different, completely different scenario altogether. Okay? God, put me in a position to where I can be used by you. Can I get an amen? Ready? Ready? Travis, just, Roger, this is for you guys. Amen. 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 You guys didn't know how to choir here, did you? It's actually a pink button on my soundboard. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we've gone for far enough. I was going to say fur enough. Yeah, that's that old West Virginia dialect kicking in. Fur enough. Um, you guys got any questions, comments, concerns, snide remarks? All right, real quick. Um, we don't know. I don't know who's listening, who might see this. But what Stephen, the confidence Stephen had, even when he was facing the Sanhedrin, knowing he was literally facing death and he knew it, he was able to do that because he knew without a doubt that no matter what happened to him, he would spend eternity with Jesus Christ. That comfort that he has, still today, praise God, but that comfort that he showed us here, you can have as well. God doesn't, God doesn't, he doesn't sit and say, well, only these people or only those people are, are eligible. Not at all. That went away with, when, when he called Paul and Barnabas, you know, to go to the Gentiles. And friends, unless you're a descendant of a Jew, you're a Gentile, praise God. Abraham's still our father, though, right? Praise God, Pastor. I was listening. But you have that same opportunity. What you have to do is just, one, you have to reach out to him and believe that Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God, came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. Then he went and he died for our sin. And on that third day he arose. God the Father rose him from the, from the grave. And one day he's going to come back. You just have to believe that. The Bible makes it, God made it so easy, so easy for us. 
you believe it and then call on him and ask him say Lord I'm sorry for what I've done I believe you are the son of God and you came to this earth you lived a sinless life and you went to the cross and you died for my sin and on that third day God the Father rose you from the dead Lord in the best way I know how I'm asking you to be the Lord of my life forgive me of my sin and let me serve you forever it's that easy you can have the same confidence that Stephen had he makes it available to everyone he doesn't care what you've done he doesn't care what you haven't done he's not looking for, for, for perfection he's looking for direction friends today's the day of salvation you can look at the world today and as we study through this you'll see that we are so close to the return of Jesus Christ taking his children home He's calling his bride home before the great, tri the great tribulation takes place. We'll be called out of here, then the mark of the beast, then all of those things that you hear about, they'll take place. But we won't be here, praise God. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you will be, but you don't have to be. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given us, dear God. We thank you for this opportunity to come together, and we thank you for your blessed word. And Father, we're so thankful, so thankful for what you did that day on Calvary, for the death and the resurrection, and Father, your promise to come back and get us. We long for that day. Oh, we long for that day. But Father, while we long for that day, let us be busy about your work. We love you, Jesus. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much for being with us.